okay, well, in this building you have like 65 water to air climate master heat pumps. And this is an example of one in a tech room. Now, this is more with the control guy will go over this more than with me, but the tech, the IT rooms are going to call for heating, they're going to call for cooling even in the dead of winter probably at times, whereas the rest of the building might be in heat and your boiler temperatures are going to be, you know, the system's going to have lower temperatures and sometimes you get in trouble with cooling. So your engineer for this building did a neat thing, he's going to economize. He's going to use outside air to kind of cool this room when possible through a, he has an outside air duct. This is your return side right here. This is, I'll get up here, this is There's a, return air filters are always on this side of the pump, the big, the big side, and the supply can discharge in a number of directions depending on the model. And you can have a return on the other side. They make different That's models, but you can always tell your smaller duct supply, you're looking up in the ceiling, and your bigger ones, the return, and your filter's going to be right here. But so, since we're in an IT room, this is good because with this economizer setup, he can close off the return air from the room and blow in, or mix and blow in the outside air, a bunch of outside air. That's the only difference. And that just opened right there, right? To, to cool, the damper to cool yeah. with outside yeah. air. It right here. See yeah. what happens a lot of times in the dead of winter with heat pump systems that don't have a big boiler, the temperatures start falling in the building loop. I, by the loop, I'm talking this water loop. Right, right. The temperature starts falling, and if you have a, you could have 45, 40 degree water going through the system, and then you have a unit calling for cooling. It doesn't want to go into cool very well because it would be like a water. You've done refrigeration or water cooled air conditioning. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you get the water so cold, the head pressure falls with it, and you you'll start tripping out a little pressure or alarms because. Okay. It'd be like running an air conditioner when it's 40 degrees outside wow. instead of 80, and then it gets you in trouble. But anyway, back to the basics here. So, 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 so yeah, this, oh. yeah, we have OSHA ladder, right? the, the right side. So, so, anyway, you you have a, it's a water to air heat pump. You don't have any water to water, they're all water to air. You have an air side coil, which is just like your evaporator coil in a normal air conditioner that sits right along in here. There's a filter and then the evaporator coil, the air coils up inside the unit. Just like any other air conditioner. The difference is in cooling season, that's an evaporator coil, just like you're used to, it gets cold. But in the winter, we have a reversing valve that switches the flow, the direction of flow of the refrigerator, and that becomes the condenser coil, which would be your outside coil on an air conditioner where you reject the heat. Now we're rejecting the heat through that, which was the evaporator until the reversing valve switch. So it can either heat or cool. Meanwhile, you've got a water side. The water, in the air conditioning season, it's just a water-cooled condenser. Instead of having an outdoor condenser, you're cooling your, your discharge pressure down with water. So we reject the heat to the building loop. In the wind, and then so then we're cooling the evaporator. In the winter, with the reversing valve switches, this becomes my condenser coil, just like the air conditioner in the summer. But now I'm refrigerating the water. I'm pulling heat out of the water. The water could be coming in at, say, 65 degrees. It might be leaving the example would be 55 degrees, about a 10 degree split. So I'm grabbing heat out of the water, refrigerating, and putting that energy back into the air cycle, just the normal refrigeration cycle. It's kind of hard to grasp. But so is that a coil right there then? Just a coil? Well, it's a, now on the water side, yeah, there is a, side. on the water side, there's a coaxial tube and tube heat exchanger. Oh, okay. Just like a water cool condenser on an ice machine or something, if you've ever seen one. Very similar. It's a, it's their patented coil, but it's a, it's a heat exchanger, a tube and tube heat exchanger. So refrigerants on one tube goes through the coil and out, and the water flows through the outer tubes and the ground goes out. So they're, it's, and the only difference is between summer, the compressor starts in heat, the compressor starts in cool. The only thing that changes is the reversing valve, and it switches the direction of flow. Changing from the condenser to the evaporator? Yep, the it, it just switches, and then your suction moves through the compressor, goes out the discharge, the discharge goes over here, or it goes over to the water coil, and then switches the return back. It's, it's, a, it's a 
I'm just changing the plug or refrigerant so that it, so, you know, changes from the gas to make the difference? Well, it, it, if I could have a chalkboard, I'd draw you up a better diagram. But yeah, basically, you just flip the flow instead of going around, instead of going left-hand circuit, NASCAR, we're going right-hand circuit. Right. It just totally flips everything. So you're just basically switching Mode. The, the, the coils or the evaporator and condenser. One yeah, yeah, they, they exchange. Yeah. And the compressor doesn't do anything. It's still pumping away. It, it, you'll hear a yeah. If it was running when it happened, you actually hear this big gush because you hear the, you know, it's like putting on the brakes. Right. Hopefully you don't do that too often but it, it, it switches the flow around. Um, now on the water side, every unit, so this goes back to your boiler room back there, and on this building we have a heat injection system. Colin will probably talk to the controls more about that because that's not my equipment. But, but see, you have to keep this building loop in a range of temperature. And if, the, if this gets too cold, I run into trouble. If the water's too cold, I'll start tripping out on alarms. The water's too hot, I'll start tripping out on alarms. And there's there's a range. You don't ever want to see this water above 100 degrees in the cooling season. Heating season would just flat overcook me or over me because I'd be trying to cool 100 degree water. And my amps and everything would go up and it'd be terrible for the unit. And then in the winter months, you don't want to see this water get below about 35, 40. You don't even have glycol in here, did you, on this job? I can't yeah, remember. Yeah, we have 50% mix. 50% mix. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so there's a jumper we can cut on the board. We'll go over that later. But so with glycol, that, that affects you a little. You can go colder. But anytime, say you get 20 degree water, and I actually got a frosted line here, I'm, I'm putting out crap. <laughs> no heat coming out of it. I mean, it, it's barely doing the job. And you get nuisance trips on freezing the water. You know, there's low pressure. There's all kinds of things that go wrong. But the, the optimum temperature is about 65 degrees, 70 degrees is a great range to be in for, for the water loop. Um, and then in the summer months, it can actually go up to 75, 80 if it has to, you know, if you have the cooling towers. This, this was ground loop? Just ground loop. Ground loop only? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so that's the part I don't understand is our ground loop's like 57. We need to keep this at 60. How well, I mean, that's often. Well, no, see what happens. If the, the boiler can come on also yeah. and inject. And in the morning, sometimes you'll have, like in the spring, you'll have some pumps and heat, some pumps and cool. If I'm yeah. heating, I'm cooling the water. If I'm cooling, I'm heating the water. Yeah. And actually, you get a zoning system going on. Like, it's, you know, like big buildings, yeah. office buildings. Balance itself. Yeah, yeah. Kind of, you know, we're so, I know it works most of the time. We, we use, you know, I track our energy a lot. We use seventy percent of our energy in three months here, and it's all heat. It's all heat, yeah. You know, and yeah. so that, I don't want to. The whole the point is was that we're not using a boiler right. the whole time. Well, you won't be. No, he's okay. not going to inject. He shouldn't inject in the summer months. He just okay. use that. But I'm just saying, you have, if you get in that sixty-five degree range. These things just hung along. The colder the water, you know, the cooling season. Sure. Yeah, they'll give you a range. Climber master will tell you. I, you know, that you can go clear down to uh, something like 40 or, or yeah. 25. There's a table in the book, but, you know, for cooling, which it's like, no, no. You keep keep it up higher in the summer. It's it's better to keep it in that range. But, yeah, and you'll, you will notice if you start using a lot of air conditioning, that field's going to warm up a little in the summer, and that temperature actually starts to climb. Yeah. It actually climbs a little. In the winter, it's actually going to start dropping. We've, Lord help you, you don't have that problem, but we've actually had boiler systems that have failed and nobody detected it, and they actually froze their water, their fill loops in the ground. They got so cold, because I just keep refrigerating, refrigerating, and they, you know, first season, the thing isn't even, the field's kind of seasoned, they kind of get a heat and cool thaw process. They get a cycle of their own, because they're just going out to the ground, yeah. and, it, and it's warming up, cooling off, and they get a cycle going and that first season it was just total cool, cool you know they were cooling it down because they yeah. were heating and they froze the field and then you're in trouble but anyway so the the incoming they're they're marked in every pump on all these pumps inlets oh the end is on the bottom the top is outlet at the top every one of your units is going to have a strainer on the inlet and you go through this hose kit in through that coaxial condenser, you're going to come out through an actuator valve, a water actuator valve. 
Some units don't have the actuator valve. You're using that, and when you start closing off pumps, the VFDs will start slowing down the building pumps, saving more energy. He has a pressure rep, pre pressure differential switch upstairs, right at that unit we were at. I should have showed you. It was sitting up there. I think that's his differential switch. It's yeah. set at 12, 13, 14, 15 pounds, wherever they balance that. And that, so if he'll start backing off as more pumps close. But when a pump calls, that valve opens. And then the flow goes out through this auto balancing valve. It has its own flow regulator. There's a stamp on each one. This one is a 7.5 gallon a minute unit. And it matches up with the 30 pump. That's how the engineer sized it. And then you can go, there's a range that you can use. You go like a gallon and a half to four gallons a minute per ton or something. There's a, there's a chart in there. Two is about dead in the center, two gallons a minute per ton. And so anyway, that auto flow valve will keep that at that seven and a half gallons a minute. What's neat about that is if you want to check the efficiency of a pump, every one of these, if you'll notice, there's always tape somewhere on them. I've been in here. Uh, when I start them up, I fill out a report. And I, I probably have tape on the inside of here because he hasn't insulated yet. And I take a temperature difference in heat and cool. The optimum temperature difference in cooling is going to be 8 to 12 degrees. And in cooling and in heating, it's 5 to 8 degrees, they say. And so you, there's, a, there's a chart or a table we, we fill out. So you take your gallons a minute times your temperature difference times 485 will give you the BTUs, 485 for glycol. And it's not like dead on, it's just telling you, gives you a rate, you know, you can kind of see how many BTUs are coming out of the pump that way. And this is a 30, so nominal it's 30,000 BTU pump. It changes with temperature and how, you know. <clears throat> but you can see how close you are to running full board. And what it also tells you, if you ever put a temperature difference across, you start reading that, get a flute 252 in your arsenal of tools, and it has two thermocouple outputs, you measure that in and out, and say we're cooling season, you should be getting 8 to 10, 12 degree temperature difference. If you're getting 20 degree temperature difference, you got a problem. Because do the math, 20 times 485, you know, you're going to have doubled the output, but it's impossible for this to put 60,000 BTUs out of the compressor can. So the higher the TV goes, the less water flow is going through there. I have a healthy refrigeration system. I don't have any water flow. So you would say, oh, man. So first thing you would look at is if the building pumps are operating. If it's, if it's global across the building, then you know it's VFDs in the room. If it's just one pump, first make sure this actuator valve's wide open, or the valves are wide open. Then I would shut off and I would check the strainer. To do that, you, there's a hand valve here on that part, and then there's a hand valve on this auto flow valve. Shut them both off, unscrew this cap, get a hose in a bucket or a bucket, and open that up and drain off a little bit of the glycol. Not much will come out when you open the strainer a little more like blow up. Then you just take a wrench right here to there, and that unscrews. It's not very tight. It shouldn't be super, super tight. You shouldn't have to bust. A little backup maybe, but it shouldn't take too much. There's an overhead gasket under there you can reuse. Unscrew that and check the strainer. And if the strainer's plugged up with crap, clean it up, start it up, you're probably fixed. But, and then to purge it out, let's see, do these have check valves? You didn't have check valves in your pipe or something. To purge it out, what I would do is I would, uh, see these, all these actuators, if you lose an actuator, there's a manual operator on them. Right now, this pump, Oh, it might be an economizer mode. It thinks it's running. <laughs> so so the, the, this, the slider here is loose. If it was closed, you could push it open just like a water, hot water heating zone valve and then click it in, get it flowing, and then you could open up the, the top and push the air back out the bottom. Just push a little of that air out, purge it out. You know, not a great deal, but the system can absorb some. But if you're going around changing strainers all day, you want to kind of purge a little of that. You might have to add a little glycol to the system at the end of the day. So that's this is one of the ones that was an alarm this morning. Good. <laughs> Maybe it's an alarm. So that's the outside stuff. The filters are here. Mind you, but 
And then I'm gonna go ahead, I just see the problem is I gotta kind of back up a little because there's a fold down tray of all, right. all these. You good? Yeah, I think I'm good. I'm gonna try to get back just a little. Oh, and there's all also on the outside, you'll see every unit has Ooh. has a big little hammer. The P trap? Any P trap that? Yeah, is? some of them didn't have them because of the, uh, this the, our flow. All right, well that might be what we're up on if it's air conditioning season. So because we can't. Because I mark, I had some listed that were no P traps, but what? Anyway, that's your outlet, your drain. If it isn't draining, that's one of my alarms. Is condensate pan overflow and air conditioning? Hey, it kicks it off. It locks it out. That's code six. There's going to be a test afterwards, so remember these codes. <laughs> There's only. <laughs> I'm guessing we have a manual somewhere that tells us when. Yeah, just like the Dectron unit we were talking about, my yeah. on belt. On it, there's a manual, and there's actually the codes on the back of this cover, I think. Oh, geez, is this a permanent split capacitor? Is that PSC too? Yeah, I don't know if they have to. I guess. Anyway, we'll go over the, the, the unit here. So this is a PSC unit, permanent split capacitance on the blower, so it's just a standard blower motor in this unit. But everything else, and all the units is the same as this, except the units with the ECM motor have one more card, and they have an electronically commutated motor. It's the latest, greatest thing. Uh, they're an AC motor that kind of runs on DC internally. They have a bunch of capacitors in the back, and they rectify the, cert the, the AC voltage and they, they run up, but there's a lot of speed settings on it. You can get four settings of heating and four settings of cooling speeds, different speeds you can run it at. And if there's a blockage in the duct, the motor actually senses it and tries to speed up. It, it does all these crazy things like that. And it has a little LED light that flashes telling you how many CFM it thinks it's at. If we get, we'll go find one eventually. But anyway, yes, this is great that this pump is locked out because that's, what we want to have. But anyway, so, but all this other stuff is the same in all the pumps besides the ECM motor. So there's this MPC board, Climate Master MPC board. And that kind of acts like it does two things. The, it's the, it acts like a thermostat in a normal unit. Out, out here on this side of it, it says LSTAT connections. These LSTAT connections go to your thermostat sensor, or basically the sensor on the wall. And that sends that, reports that back to this MPC module, this MPC board. Also, the board looks at my leaving air and leaving water temperature through these two white sensors here, these white coated sensors. And they're kind of marked on their leaving air temp, leaving water temp and ground. And then an alarm input from my main board, but my main board goes alarm, it sends an alarm signal. All this information is fed to the building automation system through these comm wires. Each unit has their own address. And this is the power to it. And then there's dip switches for the baud rate. All that stuff's all set up. If you ever have to change a board, <coughs> one of these goes out, it doesn't light up, or the air light comes on on it. You have to order a board. You have to make sure all these jumps match up like the old one. This address pots are the same. The dip switches are the same. You know, particularly our LSTAT set up for LSTAT. There's these little jumps up here. There's a manual on that. But, and <laughs> you might have some questions at first, but it's pr they, they, two screws hold that thing in and these quick connect off. You can change one of these in about two seconds. It's not like it's the end of the earth or anything. But if you go out, you're not communicating. <clears throat> the lights won't come on. The air light's on. You might have a bad MPC board and have to change it. And when it's lit up, see, this is the thermostat side right here that shows the, the outputs to, to the main motherboard. And that's telling me it's calling for a uh, fan reversing valve 
two stages of compressor if I have it. It doesn't necessarily have to have two stages, but it's calling for two stages. Some compressors in this building have two stages, some don't. The light can still come on on here calling for it. So this baby's calling for full bore cool. The other thing I need to mention on that reversing valve that switches flow, the reversing valve energizes to go to cool. It, it fails in heat like a lot of valves and things you work with, they fail safe heat. So if the solenoid coil fails, it can be a stuck reversing valve in any mode, stuck physically, man. but if the coil fails, it fails to heat. So we energized O-terminal to get cooling. So right now this baby's asking for it all. And right now you can see we got this, this is the motherboard. So it sends that down just like it's 24 volt signal. It's not DC anything special off this, this side here. It comes right down to this inlet side of this this is called the DXM board. It's a Climate Master makes a CXM and this is the DXM. This is the brain of the Climate Master unit. It looks at the head pressure, low pressure, condensate, overflow, temperatures of the refrigerant, voltage, and it reports all that stuff. And it, it also cycles, has a timers for any recycle in it. It does everything. So this is basically a thermostat now and it's calling just like any other thermostat where it comes into these outputs. If you ever blew a board and you just needed to get going, you could actually hang a regular thermostat to these connections, a heat pump thermostat and make hang it in the air and it would it would heat and cool. You know, and you wouldn't be communicating and you'd have to, you know, make sure your blower was going on this model, the blower would start up because it's not an ECM motor. You could just jump it. But anyway, so it has a set of dip switches on it, two, two sets. One controls these auxiliary relays that you aren't using, so you'll never use that. And the other one, this dip switch six, is used to report alarms back to the main board. So if you ever have to change a DXM board, you know, there's a couple of jumps you have to make sure are cut on your units. Since you have antifreeze, you have to cut JW3 right here by the test pins. And you have to make sure the new board has JW4 four cut which is right here and, and the, the factory grinds them off they're just cut down to the nubs but you get a new board that though none of those are cut and if this J4 isn't cut every time you turn it on it'll trip the transformer there these all have a, a circuit breaker on the transformer because it's a direct short through the alarm system but anyway since on the bottom of the board we have all your sensors that come into the board condensate overflow it, reversing valve input and output, high pressure, low pressure, and the two temperature probes. The two temperature probes go on either side of the expansion valve. The metering device for refrigerant is, is it's a two direction valve, so when the flow reverses it can go either direction where most expansion valves have an in and an out. This is a reversible. So they put a thermos, thermistor on either side of that, that TXV. They're measuring the refrigerant temperature. They don't measure water temperature on this unit. So they assume that if the refrigerant temperature coming out of there is getting really cold, then the water or the glycol loop is getting on the heating season, it's getting really cold and you'll lock out on a code floor for freezing the water. Same thing in the air conditioning season, if the refrigerant going to the evaporator coils getting really cold, they assume you're gonna freeze the coil and they lock out on code five for freezing the evaporator. High pressure is on the high pressure side and it, it's a lockout code two. And then low pressure is also on the high side on most of the units. They actually just measure discharge pressure and it won't even let the unit start. It's a catastrophic loss, low pressure switch. They do all their low refrigerant off of those temperature sensors. If you're completely out of gas, you get a low pressure code three. I know this is a lot of information. <laughs> now, what was the book? So now, like to get to the compressor and that, uh, like the, that valve you're talking about, the reversing valve? Oh, well, no, the, the water actuator valve? Yeah. How, how do you actually get to it? Do you got to take and get it and where is it? Does that electrical panel come out? Or? Oh, well, yeah, this panel, side panel comes off, this panel comes off over here, the blower yeah, panel. Oh. Yeah, they're, they're tight, some of them are tight, but in back here, we can take this off. You'll see a compressor sitting here and you can see the reversing valve. And if you can get to it, you can even pop the lids. But right now, see this red, this green light should be solid on the DXM board. You notice it's flashing real fast. I can't see it, but yeah. 
you can come up here too if you'd like, or I can get down. That fla fast flashing means we're locked out on something. That's a green light though? Yep, that's a green light. There's a green light, a yellow, uh, yellow light, and a red light. And then your diagnostic. Yeah, I'm going to put it in a test mode over here on this, these two terminals here, test. You short them together for just a second until the yellow light comes on. Just hit them for a second. And there, now you see the yellow light has come on and it's making an audible sound. Right. Okay, now it's going to tell me the code it's off on. And the two, two flashes, high head pressure. That's code two. One flash is no code and fault in memory. I don't know why they exactly do that, but it has no fault code in memory. That's two flashes, that's high pressure. So, one of two things, because it's a heat pump, the fewer the alarms. High pressure, if I'm in cooling season, would mean I had a water flow problem because I'm re rejecting heat to the water. Um, high pressure in cooling season means that I had an airflow problem. It may be that the outside air was off. That's probably what happened, that outside air. The VFDs, were, or the makeup was, yeah, and I don't know if it was running the unit or not. But now, the quickest way to reset this unit is to cycle power. So now you know you had a code 2 high head pressure. I don't know what mode you were in when it happened. Is there any way to look at history and see that stuff? Or? No, they're, they're too simple for that. Unless you can look at it on the front end of what the building room temperature, if he's data logging room temperatures or anything when it went down. Yeah. But so you're going to try and reset it, see if it comes back? Yep. So what we got to do is... Uh, is that what's on the wall over here? Right here. So all the dampers and everything should shut. This actuator valve should have shut. Oh, and there's also another device I got out in my truck. I think I got out. It's called a BACnet viewer. Did you guys get one on this job, or was it they? It's a handy tool to have. I should go get that because you don't have to be on the front end. I can I can I can plug into this MPC board and do a lot of stuff. So I'm going to show you that, and you're going to want one real bad. <laughs> and, you gonna give it to us? <laughs> <laughs> sure. You got a thousand you bucks in your you pocket. Really bad, you <laughs> okay, so now it reset, and if I put it in test mode again, it'll speed everything up. Test mode, it also you know made that noise and put the yellow light on, and then it showed me the code. It also shortens the anti recycle timer. All your units have an anti recycle time in them, and it, there's a power up five minute, and then there's a random timer after that. So, like if you lost power to the whole building, all the heat pumps don't start at once and brown you out. It's it, that random start thing. So if I touch those, if I touch those two test pins till the yellow light comes on again, it's going to go. It see, it's not calling. I can tell by this other thing. It's just calling for the fan. See this light up here. But now in test mode, I just want to show you. It's going to flash once. One flash, it's just going to click once, which is no fault code memory. I wiped out the code, so you ha better remember that was code two. <laughs> so this will take five minutes for this to do anything, about five minutes. The MPC board goes through its little warm-up phase, too, and it checks everything out. It started the blower immediately because you, the control guy has, in your building, occupied mode, all of your blowers run. ECM motors, this has to just run at whatever the speed is. It can have two speeds, but it's going to run. The ECM motors, we're going to try to find one of those units. They're really neat. When you're not calling for cooling or heating, they drop the blower down to like this real slow whisper, and they just pull that fresh air in and keep the room circulating. And then when they call for first stage, the blower speeds up. When they call for second stage, the blower speeds up more. And so it's, it's a real smooth system, and they're using them in schools, courthouses, anywhere where they, you know, they, they just are super quiet. They call them the tranquility unit on those ECM motors. And so your building's set up with that, so in occupied mode, I start the fan, but it's not going to run full speed on those ECM blowers. It's just real low. And ECM motors use a half, not even half the, the amperage, wattage, 
that a regular blower motor does. And it's becoming a law, just like the CFLs and getting rid of light bulbs. They're wanting to go to those motors because they on fractional horsepower motors, they save so much money. You put an amp clamp on here on, on an ECM motor, you're detecting, you know, three tenths of an amp. You can barely detect it. Are, are those like located in the conference rooms areas? Or, I mean, Gosh, why, I, why is there only well, a few? Are they in the conference room areas? No, there's some. I'm not sure where they're at. I, mean, why yeah, they're, 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 I thought they're, 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 you had the whole building. I don't think we have any. Well, maybe not. I, you know, I've probably started since I was here, probably a thousand. No, well, not. But yeah. I mean, I, I know I've been in a yeah. big high school, two high schools, and this job. I don't think we have any. Yeah, really I got the startup reports. I'm going to go get that viewer. I'll just kind of. Maybe we don't have ECM motors on this job. Yeah, that was. We we took that savings. I'm pretty sure we took them all out. All right. I don't want to lose these screws. But let me run out to my truck. Timeout. I'm going to get that back to the viewer.